through this particular series. But the thing that I really admire about you all is what I wrote up here is from Hebrews 11.6. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that's who you are. You, you all are diligent seekers because you're coming out week after week and dealing with this stuff. And I've been getting uh, really good uh, testimonies from people who have been absorbing the material. Not that it's always fun or easy because you, you remember things that might not have been the easiest memories, but uh, you can't fix a problem if you don't identify it, right? And that's what the Holy Spirit, we're asking the Holy Spirit to reveal things to us that we need to know in order to grow. So I said right at the very first week, if we go to the next one, that we would be looking for some impacts. Oh, we're going to do the review here, right? Sorry. You know what? It looks like I have a different one than you have, Maris. So I'm going to just go by what's up there. So the first week we did was on sanctification and transformation, okay? It's just important that you try to keep these terms close to the top of your mind because um, not always there's not always a lot of teaching on this on a Sunday morning or in Sunday school classes about what that means. And I think a, a base level kind of, you know, how the Bible says we can have milk or meat, and a milk version is once I get saved, everything's fine. I don't have any problems anymore. And there's quite a few people that think that. And the, the facts would say differently, right? Because just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you're not still struggling with things. What it means is that you have tools that God gives you, but you still have to learn and be a diligent seeker and apply the tools to the different situations that you're in. And sometimes the problems you're facing are not even your making, that it could be the... Like in Danny Silk's case, if you if you read, uh, sorry, if you listened or watched the video of Your Normal, uh, his wife had a very difficult upbringing, and he married somebody who brought a package of problems into the marriage and didn't fully realize it. So the tools aren't just for us. The tools are helping us to know how to deal with other people, and especially primary people in our lives, like our mother and father and our spouse and our children, that... You know, it's not that we don't have problems as Christians, it's that we have a whole toolbox that we didn't have before we were saved, and we have a lens to look through, which is the Word of God, which counters the lies that the enemy is going to keep trying to tell us. So that was part one, understanding that you're not fully converted and everything's not done the day you accept the Lord as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says we're babies, right? We come in, we're our babies, and we have milk, and we move from the milk to the meat. And a lot of the meat is learning about ourselves and growing and realizing that just because we're saved, we can still sin. But we don't have the nature to sin anymore, but now we're in this struggle against our flesh. And there's so many verses that admonish us to walk by the Spirit and don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, right? So you didn't get a free pass when you became a Christian, but you got a whole set of armor and a whole set of weapons that can fight against those things. But if you notice, it takes a lot of discipline, doesn't it? Because even way back in Genesis, it says sin is crouching at, the, at your door, and it desires to have you, but you have to resist it. And all through the word, we find this word resist, resist. But if you've got some holes in your armor, and the devil seems to know how to find those holes in your armor, you need to find them too, so you can close them. And this process of sanctification and transformation be helps us become more like Christ, and there's two verses that I put there. One is for the title of a class, which is from 1 Thessalonians 4.4. 4. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, right? So I said like a common way that you can interpret the word sanctification is holiness. And we kind of automatically know if we've been a Christian any length of time, what holy behavior is versus unholy behavior, right? Because the Bible's really clear about how we're supposed to behave as Christians. Uh, we're supposed to be honest. We're not supposed to lie. So if you're lying, that's not holy. That's not sanctified. If uh, somebody's watching pornography, that's not holy. That's clearly identified as a sin. If we're getting drunk, that's clearly identified as a sin. So it's not hard for us to find out which side of the aisle we're supposed to be on, but it doesn't mean that we don't ever feel weak and slip and, and fall into those things. But as we go through this process of transformation, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. And he never sinned. You know that, right? Could he have sinned? He could have. So he was tempted. If, if he couldn't have sinned, and some people believe that, then it wouldn't have been a temptation, would it? 
No, it says that in all ways, just like we are tempted, so is he yet without sin. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> so he knows what it's like, and he's there to help us. And it says he always provides a way out, which is awesome too, isn't it? But we have to be alert and, and aware of what the devil's trying to do. There's always a tactic against us. He, he comes after the shepherd of the flock, right? It's another tactic. Because if he can smite the shepherd, what happens to the flock? They scatter. And, and we all need a shepherd. We all need somebody we can look to. None of us have 100% of the goods all the time. We all have to go to other people for advice at times, right? That's good to be vulnerable and to be submitted to people. So that's the first one is each of you know how to possess your own vessel. Now, hopefully, do you feel like you do know how to possess your vessel a little better after five weeks of this class? If you're shaking your head, we'll give you your money back. <laughs> Hope you didn't pay anything. Oh, well, get your money back. It's nothing. 2 Corinthians 3, I quote this often. It says that we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So that's another super encouraging thing as a Christian. The longer you serve him, the more you should become like Jesus. And that helps you with your armor against fighting against the tactics of the enemy. Uh, the second one we did was performance orientation, and partly because the Sanfords have great insight on it. And if you remember, if you listen to the CD I put together, I gave you Paula Sanford's testimony about what an overachieving, striving person she was and how she kept thinking she was only going to be loved if she what? If she performed well, that's the big lie that performance orientation drills into us. And people had questions that day, if you remember, like, well, what does that mean? We're not supposed to try to do well? That's not what it means. Of course we try to do well. We're supposed to have a spirit of excellence in what we do. But that shouldn't be our identity. If I came in second, I'm not a loser. Right? right? I didn't win, but I'm not a loser because I tried. And that's what you want to tell your children, right, when they're in school. Look, if, if you gave it your full effort, if in football they said if you left it all out on the field, you're not going to win every game. It doesn't always, the ball doesn't always bounce your way. But if you can look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and know that you gave it 100%, that's a winner, even though the game might have lost, because you're not going to win every game, right? It's a great thing about sports. It teaches you both sides. So we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Nothing like that in the world. Everything in the world, the more you try it, the less satisfying it gets. With Jesus, it keeps getting better. Unless you're not seeing progress, then it can be frustrating. So that's another part of why we like to keep doing this class is because people will take it, and then a year or two later they take it again and say, wow, I'm getting something different out of it this time than the last time I took the class. Well, you're different. You're, you've grown, hopefully, and you're looking at life through a different lens. All right, so then uh, the next one, said, I already said that the, the lie underlying performance orientation is I'll only uh, be loved if I perform well. And then we have to look at what God says about that. And, he, and it says, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. I know, how many of you memorized this verse at one point in your life, right? This is a common memory verse because it's so profoundly, you know, uh, it's, it's a foundational principle in the word of God that was part of the Reformation. Right? It was a big part of the Reformation that, wait a minute, the Catholic Church was building this whole idea of works, works. The more money you give, the better your prayers will get answered, right? Indulgences and all these other things. And, and, and one, of, one of the great revelations of Martin Luther was like, no, wait a minute. That's not what it says. Paul said it too in the New Testament. It's by faith that we're saved, not by our works, right? And then this is a great classic verse. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of your works. So what can you do to make God love you more? <laughs> See, it didn't take you long to get that, right? You say it with your mouth, but you don't always behave that way, right? And, and churches can get a little caught up in that. Like, well, if you really love the Lord, you know, you'd come out early and help us set up. Or, you know, like, that's, that's manipulation. Because I do really love the Lord, but I don't want to do it out of fear, I'm, I'm not serving out of love. It doesn't say God is fear. It says God is love. We should fear the Lord. That's a different expression of fear. That's respect. Hopefully when you, when you respect people, you want to please them. And he wants you to love him, not fear him in a, in a, in a way that he's going to strike you, right? It's out of respect. And then uh, the third one, did I get to that? Uh, yeah, I did that. So then the third one was accomplishing forgiveness, which Cindy taught. And, um, you know, the, we throw that word accomplishing in there because we all probably be, understand at a base level what forgiveness is. 
but accomplishing complete forgiveness is different than just saying I forgave somebody, right? What's one of the ways you can tell if you've accomplished forgiveness? Yes? Yeah, if you see the person, you don't get this um, emotional uprising. That's a good way to say it. Just, you, you don't get emotionally hijacked. You actually don't want to spit on them if you're Italian or Greek. I guess the Greeks like to spit, right? But that's actually a blessing in that movie, uh, Big Fat Greek Wedding. So, like, you say I forgave them, but then you see them walking on the other side of the street, and you're like, oh, I'm ducking in the corner here. Well, then you really probably haven't fully forgiven them. There's still, there's still a balance in the account in your brain. Like, they still owe you something. So you gave one layer of the onion was a forgiveness. Yeah, I didn't press charges against them <laughs> with the police, but in my mind, I still haven't fully let them go. Well, who's the prisoner there? You. <laughs> So forgiveness is for you as much as it's for the other person and letting them go and saying, you don't owe me anything. And I'm praying for you that you'll have a revival in your life, that God will make himself real to you and that maybe someday you'll realize how much you hurt me. But I forgive you. No, not in a bad way, in a good way, that they'll want to come to you and say, wow, I really get it now. I'm really sorry. You can pray that the Lord would do that and open their eyes to that. And that's what you should do too. If somebody does something that upsets you and they say, "How is everything okay, Linda? And you shouldn't say, oh, no, it's no problem. It didn't bother me. That's a lie. It did bother you. You're not helping by lying, right? Now, you shouldn't say, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I do have a big problem, <laughs> right? You could just say it in a kind way and say, well, it did hurt. Yeah, I have to be honest, it really did hurt, but I appreciate you coming and, and apologizing, and maybe it's just part of the way I'm wired, but next time, this is what I need. Do it this way. Give them another option so they have a way to deal with you. And then number four was bitter judgments and expectancies. Anybody want to venture a guess on what's the difference between an expectancy and a judgment? I'll teach that one again. All right, there's eight weeks now. Yes, ma'am. Right. That's good. I'll just repeat it so they can hear it. So she said a judgment is if you say, I'm never going to give that person a place in my life again. So when you hear the words always and never, that's probably, you know, it's, got, it's been cooked so long in the oven, it's fully cooked now, and you're... You're not just expecting it anymore. You've already made a decision that this person can't change and is not going to change. Whereas an expectancy would be? Right. Right. Your heart is still open in an expectancy, but it's, but it's closing. <laughs> so like in a marriage, this happens a lot. You keep asking your spouse, uh, next time I need this, next time I need this, and they don't do that the next time. They keep going back to the way they're doing it, and, and eventually their stock price in your brain just keeps dropping. Like, they're not paying attention to me. They don't value me, and it goes from being an expectancy to a judgment. It's like cement. You know, it, it hardened, and it became a judgment, and that becomes a sin if it's a primary person in your life, like a mother or father, and that can happen really easily. And I'm curious, do any of you make a connection on the Your Normal uh, video about Danny Silk and his wife, Sherry, what judgments they would have made against their father and mother. Yeah, I get a lot of heads shaking down here. So it's not that there's not a reason to form that opinion, but what, we need, what most of us didn't know was that that was a sin because you feel very justified to be angry with the person who hurt, hurt you. But if it's your mother and father, the sin is that the Bible says you should honor your mother and father, that life may go well with you. And that's a hard one, isn't it? Because you want them to say they're sorry, and you want them to pay you back for the pain they gave you until you become a parent. <laughs> and then you realize you're not perfect either. So just like you have to forgive them, you want your children to forgive you for the way that you lacked in certain areas, right? So then uh, if we look at the verses there on Bitterroot, that's from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. By it, many become defiled. So by it, many become defiled in the Danny Silk example is multiple divorces, multiple men living in Danny Silk's mother's house, 
in, in the course, I think he said, of three or four years, there were 30 different men that, that lived in his house, and his mother didn't marry any of them. And it built up this problem inside of him. He said, I didn't have a man print. I didn't know who to connect to to look at as a role model for a man. And then a man did come into his life, but he was violent and a and, and heavy, heavy drinker. And, you know, he said at 13 years old, he's wearing a Coors belt buckle, like, you know, like, he didn't know what the heck he was doing. He was just trying to model what he was seeing. And he was, he was like imprinting is what we call it in a different class, identifications of love. It's called imprinting where young people need something to look up to. And even if it's not a good example, they'll follow a bad example because they're going to follow something. All right. So that's the bitter root. It doesn't just defile you. It, if it doesn't get dealt with, it starts to have concentric circles. You know, it ripples out beyond you, and it starts impacting the rest of the family. But we have this wonderful verse to counter that in 1 Corinthians 13, 7. I like it in the Amplified, so that's what you're getting here. The Amplified version says, Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. How does that apply? That's a hard one, isn't it? So you're in a, in a relationship, and all of a sudden, you know, I have a friend who, uh, when, when he first got married and his wife got pregnant after the birth of the child, uh, that initiated a, a serious case of multiple sclerosis. She had been healthy up to that point, but something about the birth caused her to be in a wheelchair for the rest of their marriage. 30 plus years, he, he became her primary caregiver. Now, it wasn't her fault, was it? But he's still in a marriage where he, it went one day of being happy that the first child was going to be born to all of a sudden the whole world gets turned upside down. And uh, he's still alive, but she passed uh, from cancer on top of that. So, you know, major shift. But, but you can keep your heart open. See, that's, that's not a perfect analogy here, but it says it bears up under anything and everything that comes. I've known him for 20 years, never heard him complain once. Only heard him talk about how much he loved his wife. And of course, she had it worse than he did, right? And, and we know that. But his life was massively impacted by, by what happened. But he, love, when it's really there, bears up under that thing. And we have this amazing amount of resilience if we'll keep our heart open. That's what you said, right? An expectancy is your heart is still open. You haven't made that judgment yet where you've closed it off. And then it says, it's ever ready to believe the best of every person. Got to be one of the hardest things. Because when we see how people are behaving, we think, if that's your best, that's pathetic. But you're not them. That's the problem. See, you're not them. You don't know what's causing that behavior. And they're certainly not going to change for the better with, with you saying, you're pathetic. You have a role in helping them change their behavior by the way you interact with them. It doesn't say just roll over and let them do whatever they want, but somehow try to look through a lens that says, how can I help them? And you might have to be praying the whole time, Lord, they're, they're falling apart right in front of my eyes, but I can have a response here that will be redemptive and that will help them grow through this thing, as opposed to saying, not my problem. But I'm glad Jesus didn't say that when he looked at me. <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> Because I was pretty pathetic, I have to be honest. When he found me, it was a mess. But he didn't say, not my problem. He engaged with me and loved me through it. And then it says, it hopes, uh, its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without wavering. Wow. Huh. And David Torres, our youth pastor, likes to say, if somebody was a new Christian and they read that part of that chapter, would they think of you? That hurts, doesn't it? Like, I don't know. I hope they would. Oh, that's, that reminds me of Pete. He bears up under everything. He always believes the best about everybody. Wow. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? Well, OK, so you got a little challenge tonight. And then uh, generational sins and parental inversion is what we're going to talk about tonight. And that, that's what the last chapters and the closing conclusion of the book was about. John and Cheryl, uh, you know, when we first planned this course, we didn't know they were going to be here this past Sunday and kind of lead right into what we were going to be talking about tonight. Anybody make that connection when you were hearing the message on Sunday? <laughs> yeah, several hands going up. So uh, that'll be part of the homework this week is to go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. You can watch John and Cheryl, and you can also watch the, the nor uh, Your Normal 
uh, video on our YouTube channel now. I just figured out how to finally get it up there. It was tricky. But it's right there, so you don't have to go hunting it down. So what I thought is, and before I get into the, the teaching part, I just want to show a clip from part of that uh, video and then stop along the way and talk about it a little bit and see if we can make some connections about all the different things, unforgiveness, bitter root judgments, parental inversion, and then this new topic called uh, substitute mate was part of it, but parental inversion is the other. And I think the topic, if uh, you didn't really read about parental inversion, but you read about generational curses, but it's really important topic for us because it, it can look like performance orientation because the behavior is similar. And, and what is a performance orientation person, somebody who's suffering from that, how do they behave? Always trying to please people, uh, always a little nervous, want to make sure you're happy, uh, busy, and have a list. And if you're not helping them with the list, they're not happy with you. Because by you not performing well, you're making them look bad. Wow. <laughs> See, that's not good if your parents were like that. It's like you had to be like right in line there, right? Or they were going to be looking bad too. So this person's busy too, but it's for a different reason. It's because they had a heavy load put on them when they were young, very young sometimes, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. They were asked to be doing things that a child shouldn't have to do, like take care of your younger brother, like prepare a meal because mom or dad are passed out on the couch drunk or crack or whatever you can come up with. And, and the child is just imploding under all this weight that a child's shoulders can't carry, but they're, but they're panicking because if I don't do it, my three-year-old brother can't do it, so I have to figure this out. And it creates all this stress in their system, and this adrenaline's always rushing. And if that goes on for years, they have a hard time shutting that off because that becomes almost their image of what love looks like. And it's really unfair, isn't it? Because we know, you know, from just from studying human development, that children need time to play, and they need time to feel safe. And there's another whole teaching we do called basic trust, where if you don't get that as a young child, it's really hard to make up for that later. If your foundation gets cracked in the way you can trust, and and one of the real wicked things about alcohol is it's so unpredictable. Because if you have a parent who's a heavy drinker, one night they might come home really happy and jolly from, from drinking. The next night they might come home and be really angry. And you could do the same exact thing two different nights and have two totally different responses. And that's not what children need. They need stability. Because life is hard enough to figure out for a child as, as all this complicated stuff is unfolding. If they can't rely on you to give them a steady compass, they really have a problem. They get this cracked foundation. So I'm really summarizing this quickly, and I'll go over it in a little more detail. Not because necessarily you went through this, but it could really help you if a friend of yours did or your spouse did. And, you know, go into a little bit more of that. But listening to a real story, I find, helps burn the, the principles in a little bit better. So let's try it, Marissa. Let's see how we do with, uh, with the videotape. So she soon learns a set of tools. This is how you protect yourself from abusive males. Pause. And then she begins to attract. Okay, she is his wife, Sherry. She grew up in a home where her mother and father divorced when she was young. She had three older brothers. And then her mother remarried. Yeah, her mother remarried again to a man who also had three sons. So now she's got her stepfather and her, earth, her birth father. Three brothers on both sides. How many men is that in her life? Eight. Because you got to add the two dads in there, right? She's the only woman with eight men and her mom. And that's a problem, right? Because she's getting harassed by her natural born brothers and her three step brothers and an abusive stepfather, which is not that unusual, you know, for the stepfather to treat the children from the spouse differently than their children that they bring in, right? So she has a very negative image of men. She's got eight men in her life, and none of them are a good role model. OK, sorry. That's the setup. Abusive males. I'm raised by a single mom who has a, 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 there's a male on the other side, but I never get connected to any of them. So I really don't have 
a father image until the second, the first stepfather that I have, the second marriage. And now I have a stepfather, but a whole bunch of what he taught me was, it didn't, it didn't really fit my personality or my temperament. But I'm fighting at school. I'm drink. I'm 13 years old, and I'm drinking Coors. Drinking Coors because it's the best in the world. <laughs> I'm 13 years old. I have a Coors belt buckle. And a Coors short shirt because Coors is the best in the world. Lord Jesus. We both get saved, we both come into a, a new marriage, and we both realize that everything that we've experienced has to stay out there. We don't really know what to build in here. So we start asking people, we start asking people. But it isn't long before I realize that my mom was a very unhappy lady. She's a very unhappy lady. And my job in the relationship as the oldest son was to make her happy. Stop. Is that true? <laughs> Who can make you happy, church? Yeah, exactly. God, if you're, you know, if you're looking for satisfaction coming from your spouse, you certainly have a right to expect to be respected and loved by your spouse, but your ultimate satisfaction is this way, right? And the greater this relationship is, the greater these relationships are going to be. And that, that could sound a little cliche. But she was an adult woman looking for things from her young son. Nine, he's going to say in a little while. And that's what substitute mate is. And that's why it's so dangerous. So parental inversion is asking the child to do more than their uh, age is appropriate to ask them to do. They're not wired to do it yet. They're not, th their minds aren't developed enough to even understand the complexity of what you're asking them to do. That creates tremendous stress. But then if an adult woman is talking to a nine-year-old boy about things that are relational, clearly inappropriate, but happens often. And that puts the boy in a really tough spot, or the girl if it was the father, it doesn't matter which gender we're talking about, it's inappropriate, but it's his mother. So this is the person, he, he can't count on the man part in his life, so he's gotta count on the mom. So if she starts talking to him about things that he really knows I shouldn't be hearing this stuff, he can't go anywhere, there's, there's no exit. So she's really unhappy, and now a natural result would be what he's about to say. I had a special magic that I could make my mom happy. I could do the right thing. I could just, I mean, I don't know, I just go to school and I was, I was a star. You know, I just, I could do, I could do stuff that my brother four years younger than me couldn't do. I was just the, the dog and pony show. I just could do everything, just make my mom happy. And she would talk to me about her relationships with all these men and all the grief and I would counsel my mom. I'm nine years old talking to my mom about her, her messed up relationships. I got, I got just, I, 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 am, I am adultified at Pause. a young age. Adultified. That's the word he gave it. We're calling it parental inversion because it's inverted. It's the opposite of what's supposed to be happening, right? There's no positive role model. Adultified is not a good thing for a child. And they're going to carry some of that over into adulthood. And, and, the, and the, where this gets really dangerous is you get so used to having to solve a crisis and you get so addicted to the adrenaline rush of always being upset that when you get into a relationship later in life and things are calm, you're not comfortable with calm. <laughs> Sounds a little off, right? But calm is not normal, so you have to create a crisis so you can solve it. Oversimplifying it there. It's more complicated than that. But that's why the person feels so busy all the time, is that they're, they only feel value if they're putting out a crisis. If there's no crisis, no value. <laughs> that's different than performance orientation, right? OK, let's go back to Danny. I'm, I'm involved in these deep conversations with, with, with a lady who's having all these problems. I'm good at I could, I could fix unhappy women. So I married one. 
and married somebody who was unhappy and scared and angry and had amazing skills at keeping men away from her. But I have magic. I can make unhappy people happy. Here we go. So we get married quickly. And we end up in a marriage where my magic does not work. Oh no. I've never met a woman I can't make happy. Oh no. Let me try this. Let me try that. Let me try this. Let me try harder. Let me try less. It's not working. And Sherry's never met a man she could trust, ever. And I remember laying in bed at night. We have a baby now. And I just lay there by myself, because Sherry's in the other room, because we were fighting again. I'm just, I'm just crying, because I have the rest of my life like this. What have I done? This is not how it's supposed to be. That's what happens without even trying. That stuff's laying in there, and it will pop up on the surface, and it will feel normal. It will feel normal that an unhappy person can be made happy. I can make you happy. Lucky for you, see, I'm the oldest child. I have the expectation to take more responsibility for other people than they take for themselves. I have this built into me. Sherry is the youngest child. The youngest child expects to be the center of the universe and everyone else will take care of them. This is a perfect match made in hell. <laughs> and that is what we go to work to create. It isn't until there is some confrontation and there is some personal responsibility that begins to change the way we do our family. There were a number of, of, of places where this could have all come apart. There, there were numerous places where this, this was not going to last. It took a long time. It took way too long. It, it took about... 13 and a half years. Can you pause it for a second? So um, let's just uh, anticipate based on what we know about these two people. So Sherry grew up in a home, broken home, three brothers. None of them were kind to her. Remarriage, the stepfather's not kind to her. The three stepbrothers are not kind to her. What, what was the inner vow and the bitter root judgment she would have made? Men are not kind. What else? Can't be trusted. Can't, they're never going to make me happy. Have to protect myself. And if he had any discernment, you could say, how come he couldn't see that before they got married? But what was his grid? I could fix it because I've never met somebody that I couldn't. <laughs> you see, so what became normal to you in your, mar in, in your life prior to getting married, well, there is really no perfect normal, I guess, unless we could fit every one of these perfect principles into our lives growing up. And some people have had parents that did a great job doing that, which is awesome. And if you're one of them, be very grateful for that. But because you got so used to an unhappy person, Danny, when you met one, it's like, no big deal. I've been around unhappy people my whole life. And she's saying, I know I can't trust this guy. He hasn't hurt me yet. <laughs> But there's already a judgment in there. Men can't be trusted. He said it. She's never met a man that she could trust. So why would she get married? Because it's better than being alone. I know I can't trust him, but at least I'm not alone. See, expectations are not very high here, are they? So they get saved, and they come to a church. And what's going to change those normals for them is to meet people who are interacting in a healthier way. Perfect. No, but healthier than what they understand? Yes. See the power of the body of Christ? 
and, and the koinonia of coming together with other people that can speak into your life and love you and not be prying and not trying to get underneath someplace they shouldn't be, but just by observing, say, you know what? We've been saved a while. We dealt with that too. Let's go out and grab a cup of coffee and let's talk. Just this week in a marriage counseling meeting and the person texted me afterwards and I just was dancing over the results. Like, that's all it takes sometimes is just an objective per person sitting in the middle and translating between the two people that are just so stuck in their position. But that's where the Lord just shines to come in there and, and bring oil, you know, that, that lubrication that's needed so the grinding can stop. And that's kind of where this is heading. We're not going to watch much more, but let's just go a little bit longer, okay? Before I, I learned something. See, it, it was easy to pin the problem on Sherry. Because Sherry was angry and creating distance. It was easy for everyone to see that this was really Sherry's problem. I'm the victim. Sherry's the problem. Come and rescue Danny. Poor Danny. But that wasn't true at all. All that did is it helped me stay stuck in, the, in my problem. And my problem was this, it came on the other side of a sozo. This was, the, this was probably, the, I think, the most significant change in our relationship. And it was, it was my fault. This whole time, I thought it was her fault. She needs to change. She went and had a sozo. We were pastoring the church in Weaverville. You can be a mess and pastor a church. Yes, it's true. <laughs> There's more to that story than I'll tell right here. Trisha did not say amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. She goes in for a sozo. She comes back and she says, in the sozo, I discovered that I've never felt protected. And I thought, ah, for sure, you were raised by the wolves. So you probably had to forgive your whole family. And then she finishes her sentence with, I've never felt protected by you. <laughs> Me. <gasps> I came up in the sozo? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. That's inside. On the outside, it was like, It was hard to hear, but I, I tried to listen as she, as she kind of explained some more. Because in my mind, it was, who protects the T-Rex? Who protects the T-Rex? Pause. Who's he talking about? His wife. She's the T-Rex. She's the one who's always angry. She's the one who's never happy, can't be satisfied. She... He has to protect other people from her. That's how he's seeing it. You get it? Like, who protects the T-Rex? I protect other people from you. And that's where he realizes you're going to see that that was wrong. But kind of a natural result, if you didn't have the tools of the kingdom, that's what people do. They retreat to protect themselves. So if she's angry all the time because you can't make her happy, then he's like, well, at least I can try to help the people that she's being mean to, because Danny's the victim, see? So who protects T-Rex? Question? Oh, I'm sorry, Sozo. Yeah, I should have told you that. That's their version of what we're doing right here, but the counseling, the prayer counseling. So they go in for prayer counseling, and Sozo is the word for salvation, right? Yeah, it, it, it means restoration at the end of the day. So that's what they call it at their church out in California, Bethel. So she went through a process of counseling, and she said, oh, it was really helpful because I realized I never felt protected by you. And he's like, me? How could you not feel protected by me? I'm protecting everybody else from you. But that exposed the problem, which we'll see now. We're almost done. Nobody protects a T-Rex. 
You protect everybody else from the T-Rex. And I had a beautiful case why I was right until I heard that. I've never felt protected by you. The realization came on me as I would be because I've never thought of protecting you before. Which leaves you alone and vulnerable and scared. Which jacks up your anxiety, which brings out your worst. So I am actually part of the fear cycle in your life. I am feeding right into it, just like your father did. I swore to never become your father, and yet that's exactly what I've done. That's another sign of a bitter root judgment. See, okay, oh, I'm glad Easter's jumping in on that one. When you judge something, you're destined to become the very thing you judged. As much as you think you hated it, there's a law of reciprocity here of sowing and reaping, right? So the irony here is that because she was expecting the man to bail out, she behaved in a way that you're going to just let me down, you're going to just let me down, go ahead, you're going to do it anyway, just go ahead and do it. And then he became it without even knowing that that's playing into the, to the narrative in her brain that's unhealthy because he thought, other people needed to be protected from her. Are you with me? Tracking? So all the more reason you have to renounce the judgments <coughs> to take away the legal right of becoming the very thing that you hated. It's really hard not to hate the sin that's involved. You have to separate the sin that's involved from the person. So their behavior wasn't right, but when you judge them, you basically took God out of the formula and said they're, never, they're not redeemable. I can't ever trust them, but that's not true because God can change anybody, right? Sorry to keep interrupting. We're almost done. I've justified not protecting you. That day is the day I can say our, our marriage turned around. It is now between, you know, 10 and 15 years later, and it is a completely different second half since I have learned to protect Sherry. What do you think changed in his brain? Like, How did he look at her differently after he realized she needed him to protect her? Need coffee? He saw her with compassion and looked at her through the eyes of the Lord, and instead of seeing the package that was all tough on the outside, he could see past the package and say, there's a hurting person on the inside, and if I don't protect her, who is? None of the other eight men in her life, the four, six brothers and the two fathers haven't done it, but she married me, and I'm a Christian, and if anybody's going to ever do this, it's going to be me. So I got to man up. In God's eyes, you know, there's a bad way to use that expression too, but not in this case. And it shifted everything. Once he took ownership that, well, I was seeing you as T-Rex. That's no way to see your wife. Even if her behavior was dictating that, you can't look at her that way. And, and the thing I've just tried to tell people all throughout my time here is ask the Lord to show you what he sees in the person that you're looking at. And it's usually going to be very different than what you see. Compassion's one way of looking at it, but also um, there's a verse in, in the scripture that says, he looked at them and had compassion on them as he saw them as hapless and harassed, or harassed and helpless, sorry. Harassed and helpless. So when you start seeing the pain behind what causes the behavior, the behavior is just the outcome. But you start seeing the roots of the pain of it, if, if she got hurt by not being able to trust people, now if I can show her she can trust me, that pain will be healed. Fair? Easy? No. Not easy. Okay. So you go, that's part of the homework. And can you show the other slide with John and Cheryl? Um, because they, so so there, these two videos are on our YouTube page. We'll be talking more about them next week. 
And uh, that would be your homework because there's no reading homework this week. And it's getting busy this time of year anyway, right? All right, so you see that one chart I gave you that's got the ancestral chart? This is part of the generational piece that John and Cheryl were talking about. So that's one thing we'll look at. Yeah, somebody up front didn't get a handout. There's two of them. I saw somebody giving them out. We didn't have anybody at the back desk tonight. Sorry about that. So um, can we go to that slide that says, uh, quote from Transforming the Inner Man? Yep, here we go. So let's just think about generational sins for a minute. And was anybody here Sunday to hear John and Cheryl? And they were talking about the curse of illegitimacy, remember? And they, they showed a whole bunch of, of symptoms that come from feeling like you don't belong. And who would it just be like the devil, right, to tell you that you don't belong because God wants you to have an identity in him. Jeremiah 29, 11, you know that one. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord's plans for to prosper you. I have a purpose for your life. I want you to flourish in your life. Of course, the devil is going to come at you and say, you're illegitimate. You don't belong here. You are a mistake. And all of the identity problems that come with that translate into a poverty mindset and never feeling like you belong. If it's generational, it can be broken. And somewhere back in 10 generations, they were talking about 400 years, right, of this curse of illegitimacy, it can be broken. Now, you might not know back 10 generations, but th these charts can help you start to see pa potential patterns. So notice there's a front and a back, right? And you should have each gotten one. And try to do it and go back on your mother's side and your father's side and see if you see any generations, right? any generational patterns, I say it that way. Um, a lot of different things pop up when you do this, if you haven't done it before. And I know it's a lot more popular today with things like Ancestry.com. That, that's probably great, actually, in the long run. And you could say, why bother? I'm saved now. It's all under the blood. Nothing matters about what happened in my past. Well, I tried to get to that point a lot of different ways. What's the harm in praying? If you're still dealing with fruit, if you're still dealing with issues in your life that seem to have no natural reason, there might be a spiritual reason that this thing keeps happening. And if you get to the root of it and find out there was a curse in the family of infidelity, let's just say that. Or in my family's case, it was, you know, when I did mine, I didn't put it up on the chart there, but I did mine on my father's side. And both my grandparents lost children. Now, that wasn't that uncommon back in the day. That was in the early 1900s when they were married, and children died more more readily just from you know uh, health problems, not having good health care. But there was more than that. My grandmother, on my mother's side, lost her first child because she was hit by a car while she was pregnant and lost the baby. Now cars were brand new back then, right? And they were used to horses and buggies, so she probably just you know miscalculated what the car was going to do and hit her while she was pregnant and she lost a child. So then my mother was next in line, and I'm guessing a lot of you would know what the mom would be thinking. She would be blaming herself for the loss of the first child, right? If I was, wasn't so careless, I wouldn't have lost that one. So what am I gonna do with this one? Yeah, like overprotect, right? And I'm gonna show that I'm a real good mom. Now, you know, we never had that conversation, but it's not that hard to figure that that's what it could have been. And what would, what would that have done to my mom being overprotected? Could feel sheltered or let's just say, I'm projecting a little bit now, but like you can do this, right? You can think, well, I'm gonna show everybody that I'm a great mom, even though they might not think I was such a good mom, so you're not making any mistakes. Because if you make mistakes, you're gonna make me look bad. <laughs> so what would that do to the adult? Lists, lists, ready, go. <laughs> yeah, busy. I'm going to be busy, and I'm going to have a similar mindset that I'm going to have, you know, every, there's a place for everything, and everything has a place. You know that one? <laughs> Ever hear the one that said, my house is clean enough to be happy, uh, clean enough to be healthy and dirty enough to be happy? <laughs> Ever heard that one? <laughs> it's a good one, right? It's a balance. Clean enough to be healthy, dirty enough to be happy. They don't like that one. <laughs> it's clean enough to be happy, done. <laughs> it's going to be clean. 
So on a Saturday morning when you get up, there's a list that's been being written all week. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll get to that as soon as I get back from the store. No, no. You ain't going to no store till this is done. So then I got to the point where I would just get up on a Saturday and say, give me the list. And, and then once the list was done, I could go and do what I wanted. That seemed fair, except there was another list when I got back. And if you're not careful, the list never goes away, because isn't there always going to be another list? So when do you ever get happy? See the point? That's more on the performance orientation side. Parental inversion is different, right, like we were talking about. OK, I'm going to touch on that more. But I just want to read through some of these notes from the book. It's just really good. This is a pretty profound statement that they make, because they've written so extensively on all these different subjects that we're talking about. But they say, overcoming generational sin is one of the most important keys the Lord has revealed to us. Right? So that means you know, if this is in the top five, they've got 500 the keys that they've had revealed to them. And they're saying, pay attention to this one. Families languish in fear and harm, <clears throat> excuse me, who ought to walk free and easy in God's kingdom. We can set families free, right? The Lord has given us these keys to help people get free from generational sin. That's what John and Cheryl did. They prayed it. They broke it off at the end of the service. You know, we, we believe there's power in that proclamation that they made. And then John, uh, his wife's name, Paula, she, uh, he's writing. He says, Paula and I have received countless testimonies from people who have seen all the members of their families delivered and set free one by one after such prayers. Prayers for the cessation of generational sin are normally one-time prayers. Like, so we, we had that Sunday. There was a corporate prayer done. Or uh, Easter's here, Cindy, my wife, Tricia, uh, Pastor David Torres on our staff. All of them do counseling on a regular basis. And as things get exposed, we pray for them, right? I did that in the prayer meeting I was in, and it's been great results. But it doesn't have to just stop there, because the Lord, through Holy Spirit, is really good at keep revealing more secrets along the way. And you could say, well, why didn't he just show me all at once? And it might be because you might not have been able to handle everything all at once, right? And you have to go through stages. It's like the Panama Canal, you know that one? You go through locks. And it's little stages to get over the top of that mountain and then back down the other side. So don't, don't despise that process. Engage in the process and see, like that's what they're saying here, bits and pieces of history as they get newly revealed, specific prayers about those revelations are not redundant. You get that? So just because something was revealed, now the Lord gives you more so we can go back and pray again and keep going after the root of that thing. Their continual working out and development after that first prayer. Whoever voices this prayer are like this must know his or her authority in Christ as child of the king. Powers of darkness do not yield territory to half-hearted mumblers. <laughs> All right? So you just got to know your authority in Christ. He can break these curses. That generational sin does not have to pass down the line. Amen? Amen. All right. He wants us to advance, occupy, and hold territory for him. This prayer to stop generational sin is not merely for healing, nor is it only defensive, as though stopping the encroachments of darkness were enough. So it's not just defensive. He's saying it's an aggressive warfare on the march. I like that language, right? That's how we should look at this. Be militant about it. Don't let the devil steal territory from us. It's an aggressive warfare on the march to recover lost souls from the grip of darkness. And you can really hear his heart here. He says, it's a delight to all who enter the battle and challenge the champions of darkness. So when Cindy and Easter are going through these meetings, like for years and years now they've been doing it, and they hear the testimonies. And one lady actually comes back here now, and she's a professional counselor, right? And we were just rejoicing because when she first came, if you had asked us, do you think this lady would ever be a professional counselor? <laughs> what would you have said, Easter? You know, but God, you know, God can do anything, but it looked like the opposite. And now, you know, she's writing to us and saying, I thought of you on graduation day, and now I have my own practice going, and it's all because somebody took the time to love me and care for me and work through this stuff and be super patient, right? On the hundredth time, you're saying, love believes the best, love believes the best, help me, Lord. I want to believe the best. Did you ever see the movie, What About Bob? <laughs> you know, like, I'm not comparing anybody to that because that's to the extreme. But that's how it can feel sometimes. Like, 
I don't know what to do. I'm out of options. I don't know what, what's left to do. So you fall on your knees and you pray. But look what he says. It's a delight to all who enter that battle because nobody has to stay bound. We can get free and challenge those champions of darkness. So what they said specifically about the generational blessings and sins, so that's important to remember. It's both. You get a blessing generationally or the sins can be passed down. But there's a law of increase. If you've got uh, redemption in your family history, that comes down the line. You get those blessings. So we all know Adam and Eve, I'm sorry, Adam and Eve's descendants. <laughs> my mouth goes faster than my brain sometimes. We're negatively affected by their sin, as would have Adam and Steve. <laughs> so we all inherited this uh, original sin, the Catholic Church calls it, right? Everybody good with that? Believe we all were born with a sin nature? So you understand generational sin right from that, right? So why would it be any different in the family line? My, um, my uncle came back from a trip to Italy one time, and... He said, oh, I went to the uh, Vatican, and I looked up our town, and I found out the history of our town, which is up in the mountains in south, uh, southern Italy. And it's called uh, Pesca Bagano. And it means, um, I don't remember the exact derivation that he gave me, but it was pagan rock was the, uh, was the way he translated it. And when Constantine made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire in the 400s. Okay, so this is how far back he was able to trace this thing. This was the town where everybody who rejected Christianity went to worship the pagan idols. Think that needed to be broken? <laughs> Wonder why there was never a pastor in my family line? Like, not so hard to figure that one out. And then all kinds of other issues, right? So, wow, like how many charts would you need to get back to the year 400? And then, oh, he doesn't know what he's telling me. He just comes back from a trip to Italy, and he's like, yeah, isn't that cool? I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't get the spiritual implications here, man. It's not cool. <laughs> I guess cool that he found the information. It was great for me to know it, because now I had a target to shoot at. And like you might be thinking, well, my grandparents are gone. I don't have anybody I can talk to. But the Lord has other ways he can show you. Like People are getting calls from relatives all over the world because of this Ancestry.com thing. And you can get some clues that way, and it can help you know how to pray. In, in the present, so the past, right, we, we can't go back and change it, but we can pray against the sins that happen. Did you, if you were here, you saw when John and Cheryl said, if there's anybody here from American, Native American Indian descent, please stand. And she publicly apologized to them for what the white race has done. And then she said, any African Americans, please stand. And they publicly apologized and asked, would you forgive us for what we did? Now, did Cheryl do it? No, but she was identifying with her race who had done it. And is that, is that redeemable? Yes, it's redeemable. You can do that. It's called identificational repentance. You identify with your ancestors over their sins. Daniel does this in the book of Daniel. He said, Lord, we have sinned against you. He hadn't. But his people had. So you can do that as well. And stand in the gap for people. I've done it for men who've been abuse, abusive to other women. And when somebody's up here for prayer for that, I, I say, can I stand in the gap for that person that hurt you? And would you forgive me? Even though I didn't do it, but I'm a man, right? So that was enough of, of somebody that that person could say, yes, I forgive you. And that's healing in and of itself. So there's a lot on this topic. The present is that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So Danny and Sherry, if you go back and watch the whole thing again, and just look at it through this lens, think about what we do to survive, right? So Sherry had to get herself into a, a protective place. And, and many times people don't remember things when they come to this class, and then the Lord will drop clues in on them, and they haven't thought about it for 20 years, partly to protect themselves. Because what happened to them was so bad that they had to put it in a box or they couldn't function. It's like post-traumatic stress in some ways, but that is not going away. It's just in there in the back closet. He wants us to be healthy enough to go get it and take it out and say, we're done with you now, goodbye. Amen. Not easy, but worth it to try. That's the present. So fearfully and wonderfully made. 
He had his issues. What was normal to him was trying to make an unhappy woman happy. She had her issues. All these men in her life, nobody, nobody was trustworthy. Everybody's violating me. Now they come together. Was his thing normal? No. Was her thing normal? No, but it was their normal. That's why they call it the CD is your normal. So he says, when we came together, which one should we use? Neither. <laughs> but if you don't have either, he says, you have a toolbox deficiency. So if it wasn't that, what should I do? And that's why being in a church with healthy relationships and healthy marriage is so valuable, because you can look at people and talk to them and ask them questions. And if you didn't get it from your earthly parents or your earthly father, it might not even be your fault. They could have died when you were younger, and you just didn't have that person there. Then you get it through the body of Christ and through other good examples like a Joyce Meyer, you know, somebody that you could really look up to who's a role model. So that's the present. Just recognize when I say this is Psalm 139, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. That means most of the people you're looking at are a lot more complicated than you realize. And there's a lot more to them than you realize. And if you just went by their education level or how much money they make on their job, that's not nearly enough to see the value and, and to determine whether they're worth your time, because they are. That's all I'll tell you, they're worth your time. And then we could see in the future our present sins and, and our obedience, that, that brings the blessing. When you're obedient, you get the blessing. When you sin, it brings a curse on you, right? That's affecting my children and their children. So what I'm doing today isn't, isn't neutral. It doesn't sit by itself. It can be a good influence down the line, or it can be a negative influence down the line. I know which one you want. We all do. I think I might skip through a little bit further. Go to where it may seem unfair. I think it's two slides down. And this is something we've heard just over the years, especially around the Bitterroot Judgment, is that it seems unfair. In Joyce Meyer's case, you know, uh, to use an extreme example, that her father raped her over, I think she said over 200 times in the course of her high school years. There wasn't a day she said that I wasn't afraid of my father. And now all of a sudden she's an adult, she did nothing wrong, and yet if she doesn't forgive him, she's sinning. It seems so unfair, right? Well, why do you think life is fair? There's sin in the world. When Adam and Eve sinned, it started a war. It's not fair. And that's what he's saying. It seems unfair for children to suffer the effects of the law for sins committed by their ancestors, known or unknown. And it isn't fair. He says it. Of course it's not fair. God is fair. But since sin entered God's world, life has not been fair. All the more reason you have to spend so much time in the word. You have to understand the truth. It's only the truth you know that will set you free. You can know about the truth, but if you don't know the truth in here, if it's not built right in, it's not setting you free. So you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You really have to study this thing and stay with other Christians who you admire, who are life-giving people for you, because the world will just pull you down with a totally different way of looking at life. All right, and then it says, God has worked from the beginning to reestablish his justice through the cross. Sowing and reaping was established before the world because it's law. Sorry, Siri. Law was designed to increase blessing. All right, so it's not a bad thing. Sowing and reaping, and the initial intention was, I'm a loving father. I bless my kids. They're going to be loving fathers. But once sin came in the world, it can work in the opposite. If I sow a seed of rebellion, then I reap a whirlwind, right? Sow the wind, reap the whirlwind. Uh, so that's what could seem unfair. All the more reason we dig in and say, well, I didn't ask to be put here. I didn't, uh, it, it wasn't a voluntary assignment on my part. I got put in the family I got put in. I got put in the life, but here I am. And I'm going to choose to flourish where I am, just like Joseph did, right? Just like many people in the Bible did, because squawking about it isn't going to help. Our words are very powerful, aren't they? Complaining is not so good. I'm going to go a little bit faster. Next page, it says, when Sid, that second paragraph, when men sow to the flesh, they reap corruption from the very laws that were designed to bring blessing. Is that point coming through? That's a sowing and reaping piece, right? You can't expect 
that only the good side works. You can't expect that if we get blessings from our ancestors that we're not going to also get generational sins coming down, right? It's the same law. It's just whether it's a blessing or a curse. Um, whenever men will let Jesus reap the dire, this is that last paragraph, the dire effects of the law, forgiveness and atonement on the cross, God can prevent the tragedy. So I don't know how many times I've said it, but many times I've said we don't try to fix the problems. We take the problem to the cross. It has to be crucified. It's death, burial, and resurrection. If I'm holding unforgiveness to somebody, I don't fix that. I take it to the cross. I go in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. Remember when he did that? And he took on the sin of mankind. So I get in the garden and I look across at my father or I look across at my mother, whoever the person is that I'm trying to forgive. And I say, Lord, help me see what you see, but help me realize, but for the grace of God, I could have done the very same thing that they did to me. I could have done to somebody else. Joyce Meyer had to say, if I were a man in my father's condition, I could have raped my daughter 200 times. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's true, though. Because sin is a, a, an equal opportunity destroyer. And we don't know what her father lived through to do that horrible things to her daughter, right? You're just looking at the, at the results of a horrible life coming out the way he was behaving. But what, to truly forgive them is that's this last paragraph. If I'll let Jesus reap the dire effects of that law through forgiveness and atonement on the cross, then God can prevent that tragedy from happening, okay? I already told you about Danny and Sherry. And then I, I want to um, just give you a couple of highlights off of this parental inversion piece. So um, we had somebody here in the church uh, for many years, actually, that took the class every year, actually helped us train, was one of the prayer ministry, ministers at the end of the service. Are we going to have that tonight, too, do you know, by the way, Easter? We have in prayer. Anybody here serving on the prayer ministry? Yeah, we have a few people. So, we, yep, Jim's coming. Okay, good. Yeah, that's an important thing. Um, and she realized after coming to the class, I think it might have been after the sixth time. So this was like seven years into being in church. She had been through the class six times. And, and then the Lord knew she was ready to remember some of the really tough things that happened to her. And... Uh, it was really tough. I won't go into all the details, but in her family, she was asked to do things that only an adult would have been able to handle just as a young child, and, and it wasn't good, but she had forgotten. And, and, then, and then the Lord realized she was at a place now where she could handle it. Even though it was difficult to handle, she cried a lot when she realized it, and it had an immediate short-term negative impact on her family because we know that people that are used to being in charge as a young child and they can't turn it off, they get a lot done, don't they? <laughs> Problem is, so do you. <laughs> because you can't ever rest around somebody who's wound up like that because there's always another job to do. But this lady was mowing the lawn. You know, She was doing things that most husbands would be doing. And now all of a sudden she realizes, I don't have to manage the whole universe. I can stop. I can, I can get off of this treadmill. And the husband called me, who was a good friend of mine, and he said, what did you do to my wife? She doesn't want to mow the lawn anymore. <laughs> I said, amen. That's a really good sign. He's like, no, it isn't. <laughs> yes, it is. You see what I'm saying? It, it's going to cause some disruption in the, in the things that people have gotten used to, but small price to pay. Because within a year, he's calling me and said, we've never been happier. I've never been happier. Our house is at peace. It's not always this tension about what's not getting done. If she saw me laying on the couch on a Saturday, oh my God. In the past, now she could relax, see? Because it's a profound thing when you get healed of a big trauma like that. And that's what it was. It was a trauma. And when you heard the details, it's like, man, God bless you for surviving what you went through. So what would the symptoms look like? All right, I'm just gonna read it. I don't mean to be dry here, but you may be able to identify with it. So if you picture Danny Silk's mother, right? She was the one that was talking to her nine-year-old son, almost with adult language like you would with a lover, right? Inappropriate for your son. 
So occasionally adults who fulfilled these parental obligations. So now if Danny is an adult and he's not a Christian, he doesn't understand this, what could have happened to him? Uh, it says, by far more commonly parental inversion is expressed through any number of the following forms of manipulation. Could be a man or woman. Using the child as a confidant and seeking comfort from the child, right? That's a really unfair place to put them. Holding a child in order to be held. Taking a child's misbehavior as a personal affront and say, how could you do that to me? Demanding love and gratitude, saying, after all I do for you, is this the thanks that you give me? You don't love me. Wow. Punishing through pouting or acting hurt or giving them the silent treatment. Expecting the child to simply know what the parent wants and then punishing the child for not figuring it out because this is all the things that happened to them when they were growing up. You get it? They were being treated as if they were an adult, but they were a young kid and they couldn't read the situation. So they're getting punished for things they didn't even know they were doing wrong. Kids at nine years old are supposed to be out playing. Not good, right? Um, I would just taking it personally if the child doesn't share the same tastes or opinions, expecting an adult attitude from a young child. Um, I don't want to go through all of them, but I think you're getting the point, right? Thank you. All right, so I want to go over the prayer. That's on the other side of uh, the second handout that I gave you, right? No, I thought I had one here, but I don't. Does anybody have an extra they gave me? Thanks. So if you flip to the one side where it says parental inversion and substitute mate, got seven minutes, so we're closing, closing in on the finish line here. I'm going to read it. It says, because many symptoms of parental inversion resemble those of performance orientation, it's important to make the distinction. Performance-oriented people believe that they must earn the right to exist. So their concern is what? It's self-centered. Their actions are designed to give them a sense of worth in the world. I'm only going to be loved if I perform well. So get out of my way so I can show everybody how great I am. Okay. But parentally inverted individuals are, are moved by quite another concern, that of making things better in the family and in the world. In this sense, they are truly others-centered as opposed to self-centered, taking undue responsibility for the well-being of those around them. This is why, without understanding their own motives, these folks can hardly bear to hear that their actions might hurt people instead of helping them, smother them instead of giving them life. We must not accuse them of selfishness, for that would be unjust. Instead, we can gently minister truth to their wounded hearts to try to, uh, who try so hard to fix the world around them. All right? I th thought that was well said. You want to show compassion to these folks by saying, you can take it easy. I know you grew up in a crisis mentality, but we're not in a crisis anymore. You can relax now. And one um, teaching, he said, you can resign from being the governor of the universe because <laughs> that's what they were meant to feel. And then there's a couple of questions here that they give too. Um, create a profile of somebody who is parentally inverted and you saw that with Danny Silk. What's the sin of usurpation? Anybody want to guess on that one? I'll be right with you, Jim. You're, you're usurping the role, in Danny's case, as a nine-year-old boy, he was usurping the role of the man that should have been there for the father. And, you know, and as the father figure, you're not able to handle it. You have something? Yeah, with parental inversion, um, the other thing that can happen, I was the youngest son, but I had the experience of all the responsibility put on me. And so another thing that outcome was um, resentment towards my older brothers because I was the parent and they were acting s like children and they were a year and three years older. I resented that and that became a thing of unforgiveness. But mm -hmm. So that's just an, another dynamic mm -hmm. in it that 
when you're not experiencing the childhood, you can also build up resentment, not just towards your parents for putting you in that place, but for your older siblings or your younger right. siblings for not helping you out. Or putting a demand on you yeah. that, that you're not able to meet. Almost like Cinderella, you know, like she was the, the one who was being asked to do everything and nobody else wanted to pull their load. So thanks for sharing that. Um, all, um, you know, if there's anybody else here who grew up in a situation like this, we would love to pray with you tonight or another time if you can't stay tonight because the, the fruit that we've seen from people overcoming this one is really pretty dramatic. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. Because I don't like to just read these prayers. I like to go through them a little s more slowly so we can understand what's behind it. These, these were years in the making, right? These are from just thousands of hours of counseling sessions that the Sanfords did. And um, why don't we just read through it first, and then we'll pray it, and I'll just make some comments along the way. So I thank you, Lord, for caring enough for me to pursue me and to help me see that in my family, the parental roles were reversed. I see that I stepped in to fill the gap, and regardless of how necessary or how noble that may have seemed, I recognize I was wrong. In usurping my dad or my mom's role, I denied my own childhood. You didn't design my child's shoulders to carry such a heavy weight. So I forgive my parents for what they did or did not do. I confess that I have judged them, and you could imagine what you would judge somebody for in that case as being uh, unfit to be a parent. You might, you, know, you might have said that. Why did these people ever even have children if they weren't going to take care of us? Why did they have children in the first place? I ask you to forgive me for those judgments and the bitterness they built in my heart. And I also confess that I judged you, Lord, as being a weak God, one who needed my help. I thought I had to do it for you. This is unusual, right? Forgive me for wounding you in that way. <laughs> Most people would not think to talk to God that way. I have avoided intimacy and corporateness. Now, corporateness just means the gathering together in a church setting, being part of the family of God, being vulnerable to each other and living life together so that we can trust each other. Um, so I've, I've avoided that. Forgive me for the way I've cut myself off from emotion. I know I did it as a child so that I could function, but now it's a defense mechanism in my life, and I've hurt many people with my inability to feel. Forgive me for trying to take over for you and so control my spouse and my world. I, reso I resign, Lord. I'm not in charge. Father, it frightens me to ask you to take charge of me and those that I love to work with. Can you understand where that would come from? You're so used to being the one that's in control that you don't want to relinquish control even to God. So many people have let you down so many times. It's like, no, I'm not getting burned on this one again. I have to do it. But that's what faith is. It's trusting that somebody else can handle it, and God can. But then it says, but I am tired. <laughs> so that's what happens. These folks are exhausted from working so hard and trying to solve so many problems. Bring my fear and my pride to death. I want to trust in you, to rest in you. I ask you to speak peace into my inner being and calm my striving, even as you calm the sea, in Jesus' name. All right, so powerful prayer. And then let's do the other one for substitute mate. Just go through it. Lord, I ask that you help me to forgive my mother and father for pulling me into the role of a spouse. And Jim, sounds like, you know, this is something that you might, might pray, right? Uh, or, any, or any of you that can identify with this. I did not, could not say no, right? Like, think about that for that nine-year-old kid. What was he going to tell his mother? Get out of my room. I don't want to talk to you about this. She's in charge. She's leading the home. I did not and could not say no. I have had such mixed feelings, pride that I should have, that I should be chosen. So there's that, you know, puff chest for the little kid taking charge. Anger that the other parent did not fill his or her role and protect me. And confusion because I was in a role I couldn't understand or fulfill. I choose to forgive myself for complying to that subtle coercion. Um, you, it's like, not the easiest sentence to understand, but you have to forgive yourself too, right? For You don't beat yourself up for not being perfect in that role. You were a child. 
I forgive my parents for the specific things they did, and I confess and ask forgiveness for the unexplainable anger. Now I know it was toward mother and father and you, Lord, forgive me. You can understand where that anger would come from in a child, right? I'm being asked to do physics as a six-year-old is how it feels. Like, you want me to figure out how to take care of my brother and how to work the stove and how to cook a meal and wash the clothes? Like, what the heck? I want to be playing in somebody's backyard on the swings. And then that last sentence, it hurts me to see how this has affected my own marriage and my spouse. I see the damage it has caused and I want it to stop. I invite you to bring it to death Bring healing and restore to me, to us, the years the locusts have eaten. Put my relationships right, Lord, including my relationship with the Father God. So, um, again, if it doesn't apply to you, at least you understand it better now. It was enormous help to me in my role as a pastor, but not just in that role, just in a life role. We have a question. I have a friend, or should I say a person in my life who's very significant to me. And I could see parental inversion, and I could see substitute me because dad worked in Hong Kong for a lot of their life. But because dad and mom were married and a real couple, it's kind of like they can't see how it affected them. And it's like, oh, I was good. I was good. I was good. I was good. So it's kind of like you know it, but you can't say it because they don't agree with it. But or you might be, if you say it, you might sound like you're criticizing them and you know they were trying hard to provide for you even though they were away. Right. So it's a conflict. So it's a lot of difficulty in even talking about even the corporateness, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's no connection. So where and how would you lead that prayer, you know? Sure. So it's probably not going to come uh, in the first conversation. Uh, you, you, you don't want to you don't want to manipulate people, but if you can see something that they can't see, you want to have conversations that try to help them see it, and and introduce some, uh, a difficult topic in a sensitive way. So that's just asking the Lord, put your words in my mouth. You want this person healed, Lord. I do too because I care about them, but they can't see it right now, and it's like they put a wall of armor up because they want to protect themselves. And people that are survivors like this got really good at hiding their feelings, right? Because they had to do more than they were, they, they should have been asked to do at the time. So they'll keep a tough face on the outside. But the Lord has this wonderful way through Holy Spirit. Like if you talk, if we talk after class and you give me some specifics, um, I can tell you, you know, just some general ways that you can guide a conversation. You all, you all know that's not manipulating anybody, right? It's just how, trying to help guide them to a place where you know the Lord wants them to get by helping them realize the, the, the thing that's been a blind spot to them, all of a sudden it's clear to you, but now you have to help them see it. And that may take a little time. Now, how does this work if, say, mom passed away at 21 and dad kind of continued to stay off in Hong Kong and then now they're back in aging and not taking responsibility is that kind of uh, by, by the time the person is an adult that was parentally inverted that took on too much responsibility they have to get healed of trying so hard now right so different situation how they interact with their parents is going to have to forgive for sure because you know like if you're that kid at the baseball game and you see the parents up in the stands and you know your parents are not there or you know like you just get angry like it just builds all these layers on the inside like why me like what the heck's wrong with me how come all these other people are here and and my parents aren't like what's what's wrong with me what about if the parents were there but not there yeah right that's almost you worse could have been or weren't engaged. They were physically there, but not engaged emotionally. Right. Yeah. Like, every story is, but my parents were together. My parents were together. My parents yeah. were together. But it's like, right. you never had an intimate conversation with your father. That's clues that you're getting that they want to apologize for their parents. And it's hard for them to, to, put, to paint their parents in a bad light. Because it's my parents. But the I walls, only got two of them. The walls are going up emotionally. Yes. And keeping everybody out. I know, including you. 
but they can't see it. Well, you're going to help them see. And the Lord's going to help you find out how to help them see it. That's really key. Because you can hold up a mirror, but if they can't see it, you know, you got to, I call it like getting the combination to the lock. The Lord will show you the right combination to the lock to get behind that wall and help, the, help their eyes open. It's a supernatural okay. thing. Amen. Amen. All right, how are you doing? It's after 8.30, so I'm sorry I ran late. Um, anybody that's going to be on the prayer ministry team, if you could come up, we'd appreciate it. And um, we're here for you all. One more week to go. Thank you for being so diligent. You understand the homework? If you didn't watch, uh, I, I would say watch it again. It's so good. Just take notes through the Your Normal um, video and then watch the John and Cheryl from Sunday and take notes. And we'll wrap it up next week. Amen? So let me just pray over you. If you have to go, let's just stand and we'll pray. And um, ask the Lord for insight. Can you lift your hands? Father, we just uh, lift our hands as a sign of surrender to you. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you to just come in and, and um, open our eyes uh, of our understanding to, to know what you want us to see and to be able to, to face up to some of the difficult things that we might have faced in our lives. We know that, <clears throat> like we read earlier, you want to transform us into your image. And we want that to happen, Lord. So we, we want to be willing people on this side of the equation. And we just say, pour out your blessing. Everybody that's here, Lord, I bless them for all these weeks they've been coming so faithfully. And we say, we're moving forward. We're not going back. We're moving forward into who you called us to be. And we're going to take on the full identity that you have for us in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Have a great night. If you need prayer, just come on up that side aisle and you can peel off to the teams that are up here.